Hello, everyone. I have the pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Barbara Thiers. So, Tears. Tears, I'm sorry. It's all right. I should check with you. Barbara Tears. Um, and she is coming to us um, from um, being the director emerita of the New York Botanical uh, Garden Herbarium. And she now works with the um, Denver Herbarium. And um, she has a PhD from the University of Massachusetts, an MBA from San Francisco State University. And she's been heavily involved in promoting the digitization. Dis digitization. Yeah. Very, that's a <laughs> hard a word. One, yeah. You probably have to say it all the time. Yeah, I, I <laughs> say it better than I spell it. <laughs> um, so we're really excited to hear about some of her work with that today. Um, but she's also been an instructor at CU Boulder um, and is continuing research on bryophytes which is exciting. And um, she's also served as the, as the president of the American Society of Plants Taxonomists and the Society for the Preservation of the Natural History Collections. And she's written a book about the history of herbarium, which is really cool. I have to check that out. Um, so with that, we are excited to introduce Dr. Tears um, for her talk titled Species Occurrence Data and the Biodiversity Collections Network. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to have the chance to talk to you today. Um, as Allison said, I've been involved in the digitization of collections. My own collection in New York was third largest in the world with over 8 million specimens. And from the mid 80s on, I was kind of consumed with first how I could make my life easier and managing these, but also how we could do a better job of sharing the, the data. And, um, you know, one of the things we've always said is these data are so important for so many other, for, for climate change, for so many things, and they are being used that way, but we've never, we've never really crossed the threshold. We haven't had many conversations with folks like you, and um, the group I work with, the Biodiversity Collections Network, about which I'll say more now, we're very keen, especially right now, to sort of try to bridge some of those gaps and see if we have common interests and common objectives we can work to together. So I'm just here to tell you about you know, my side of, of that. Um, but first, oops, you didn't do that. Uh, okay. Maybe, wait, I got it. There we go. Okay. Just to remind you about biodiversity collections, um, it covers a wide range of things, anywhere from um, culture collections to plants, insects, wood, fossils, fossil footprints. Um, we really know have no idea how many of these items there are. It numbers in the billions. Um, but we don't, we've never really been able to, to count them. Um, making natural history collections is a tradition that started in the 16th century. It, um, it was a European phenomenon. And there were many other cultures in the world that had a, as much, had an unbroken record of, um, of biodiversity, you know, going back to, um, to you know, thousands of years. Um, that was kind of maintained, like in China, through through, through books and, and in the and in the um, in the Islamic world, also through texts that were updated regularly. But why, you know, the question is interesting. Why only in Europe did they maintain collections? I mean, one of the reasons may be that no other culture really had this period of intellectual stagnation. It was the Middle Ages, and when the Renaissance began, there was kind of a new idea that we should observe directly from nature. So natural history collections are part of that. Other things that fall into that same category are um, telescope and the microscope. So it's a Renaissance phenomenon that developed and now natural history collections are essentially in, in every country in the world. Um, and they're maintained in institutions of a wide range of types, government facilities, universities like CU Museum, um, uh, private institutions like zoos and gardens. 
And um, again, we have no idea how many institutions, collections institutions there are, but the um, Global Biodiversity Information Facility has a, an index of about 8,000, and that's likely less than half of what actually exists. Um, so in the past few years, well, the community I used to represent was sort of just the preserved collections, things that are dead either recently or a long time ago that are maintained. But in recent years, we have expanded that con the, the, the group to include living collections. And living collections are, again, very diverse. We have living plants and animals. We have germplasm collections and also genetic stock centers, as well as micro, yeah, well, my, yeah, micro collections fall in there too. And um, this is very new. And the two communities, I have not really, I guess, developed a common identity yet. And um, I personally haven't sort of developed the vocabulary, the inclusive vocabulary that's appropriate for talking about both. I come from the preserved collections world, so I have a lot to learn here too. And we have many differences. Some, some living collections are actually things offered for sale. It's a completely different model than keeping things forever. But on the other hand, all told, we've come to the conclusion we have far more in common than we do different uh, differences. So I just wanted to make sure that, keep in mind that we're talking about this, even though if one of them was sitting in the audience, they would point out a number of things, terms that I use that they would say, well, that's not exactly how we say it. We're still working on that. Um, within, collections, and, and this applies to preserved and, and to some living collections, there's a there's a standard set of metadata that accompany each one. They're, they're widely diverse in how they share it, but basically with any natural history collection, the things that you will always find for it to be a, a collection worth keeping, the, the name of the organism, the name of the person who gathered it or shot it or whatever, uh, when it was collected, and where, which might be anything, it could be as vague as a country, um, or it could be you know, all the way to geographic coordinates. That's basically considered what's absolutely necessary. So that roots us in uh, you know, what organism it is, what time horizon it occurred, and where it was. Um, Secondary, there can be a lot of other things too. Habit, where something is growing, the habitat, the substrate of its plant, uh, associated species, parasites, commensals, age, sex, behavior, human uses. Those are all secondary uses that you would not find with all, but you would certainly find depending on the collection type. And where you find those data, another area was very diverse. Um, sometimes it's all on a little tag attached to the foot of an animal or on an insect pin. Sometimes in addition to a pinned insect, there's actually a registry with more information. Herbarium specimens will have a label attached to, this is a dried specimen, um, a label attached to it. Um, and <laughs> You can see some of the challenges we face on the right, that this is, these data have been recorded, as I said, over five centuries. So you deal with handwriting, you deal with, of course, changes in the names, um, changes in the names of places, all of that, different styles and recording information. This, this, you know, creates a huge challenge for us and for anybody involved in digitization, um, there's a, a depressing amount of time spent sort of learning a collection and what certain scribble, you know, who's, who's, who that is, um, how they wrote things and so forth. So it's, um, it's not really a fast process. Um, but the idea of, of um, transcribing these data into structured format came about sort of in the 1980s. I remember well, I didn't really, I didn't really know what a database was. I had um, I had a kind of a weird, dedicated word processor that I imagined somehow using, but I kept thinking, if only there was a way that you could like sort by different parts of information, you know, and you could like, <laughs> count things, and uh, maybe wow, even like could you put them on a map? And it wasn't until I'd been giving a talk to the board at the New York Botanical Garden um, about 
computers, the futures of computers at the New York Botanical Garden. And I kind of imagined all of these things, feeling, just hoping no one was, no was going to ask me, well, like, how would you exactly do this? Because I didn't know. On the way home through Grand Central Station, I bought a copy of the Whole Earth Catalog, 1985, which at that time was all about software, software ideas. And I read about the database. And <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> and I bought a database. I bought DBase and I learned DBase programming. Um, so, you know, in, in the early days, there really wasn't anything. And we fought a lot in the community about the best software to use. Um, but now, you know, most of those problems have, have been solved. Um, but the work transcribing these data still remains a huge, a huge challenge. Oops. Oh, no. It's about weird. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped it. Right. Thank you. After the time that we began the thing of transcription was the idea that we should really capture images because you know we were we were capturing the the where and everything, but we weren't capturing much about the organism itself. Um, so um, imaging became a thing. Um, a lot of trial involved, trial and error involved there. Insects remain a tremendous challenge, first of all, because you have an insect with a pin and then all the little labels on the pin as well. So you have to take a pin out, you have to lay out the labels and then take a picture. So it's a huge amount of time per specimen. Um, there have been various ways of trying to automate that, um, but it still is time consuming. Things like fossils can require anything from a camera like that to you know a camera that stands this high. Um, herbarium specimens, which is what I worked with, are the easiest because they're flat pieces of paper of standard size with a plant glued to them. And you simply can, you can, you know, now there are these conveyor belt mechanisms which just run them through. All of Smithsonian's five million specimens were done that way in an amazingly short amount of time. And then going beyond just sort of the record of the of the what you see with your eye, um, there's been a lot of work in um, CT scanning for vertebrates so that you can actually sort of go beyond what you see on the surface, understand the internal structure without the kind of destructing sampling you'd have to do in order to get that. Um, but now it's standard to capture an image as well as just the data. Nobody just does the data anymore. And a lot of times the image is captured first and then the data are either used, um, you can either use, sometimes you can use um, OCR type methods to capture it, but at least you can go much faster when you separate it. Um, the big the big advances that came for us uh, was this during this period between 2011 and 2021, which was when NSF funded a program advancing digitization of biological collections, which was a 10, mil, 10 year, $10 million project to digitize at the first, they said all the collections in the United States, which didn't happen, but it did fund a lot. This map shows all the different institutions that were funded. Um, and it also funded a digitization, we called it the hub, the IDIG Bio Hub, which was a collaboration between University of Florida and Florida State. And they took charge of sort of teaching people digitization, efficient digitization techniques. They also created a data repository and um, did a lot of work towards sort of stimulating use on the development of tools for analyzing these data. And I did bio funding is, I mean, ADVC funding is over, um, although NSF will still support digitization, but I did bio continues to be kind of this hub for the, for, for the, the country. <laughs> As digitization began, there became a, a need for sort of standards, you know, what, what, how are we going to, what taxonomic names are we going to use? How are we going to describe a certain things so that we take full advantage of the ability of a structured system for sorting and so forth. So about 28 years ago, a group formed called the Taxonomic, Bi um, taxonomic Bi well, Information Standards used to be called Taxonomic, taxonomic Data Working Group. And over the years, they have done a huge amount to sort of 
promote and shore up existing standards um, and to create new ones. The existing standards was to the way we abbreviate names of people when they are cited as authorities on specimens, um, geographical place names, country names, so forth. So they developed, uh, they those were sort of incipient standards that they promote and update as needed. The most important things they've done though were the standards they developed themselves, which were the Darwin Core standard. And this applies to those metadata I was talking about. Um, it's an attempt to um, have a standard for every type of preserved or living collection that you could have. Um, so it deals with um, occurrence, like we talked about, event, location, identification, geological context, um, relationship between <laughs> organisms or between other entities, and also measurements, assertions, and so forth. It's a very broad standard. It continues to be developed, but it was key to us be being able to exchange data because at first we thought only in terms, I thought only in terms of how will I share my data, but obviously these are all so much more important when we and combine them all and store them together. Darwin, key, Darwin Core was key to being able to do that. It was a tremendous effort over many years, 10 years, it still goes on. The other important standard that they developed was the audiovisual core, it used to be called the um, Audubon Core, but uh, actually other, there are a number of other um, standards that include um, stuff about images, uh, images, films, uh, videos, um, uh, sound files, uh, but it's distinctive, the audiovisual core and its focus on file size, how large the file is, the intellectual property, who owns the multimedia item, and also the provenance, how it might have been changed or modified from its original source. So these two standards are kind of key to, um, to our being able to combine data and also um, you know, yeah, to being able to combine data across resources. There are a number of other things that have developed, which are not exactly standards. They're more like reference databases that help in all of this work. Names, taxonomic names for plants, for example, there's the International Plant Names Index. Uh, same for fungi, there's an index to all fungal names. Geolocate is a software that's built into many, uh, it's attached, I guess you could say, to many of the different softwares that are used for cataloging specimens that allows you to georeference the site very quickly. Um, there's a global registry, as I mentioned, I think before, of, of institutions, so you can correctly cite the institution things are from. Essentially, all the biodiversity literature prior to 19, what would it be, 23 now, is digitized and available through the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And then Bionomia is a newer resource, but that will is a place to, to link information about people who have collected or identified organisms with the kind of biographical detail you might need to figure out who the collector was or wasn't in some cases. Um, this effort is not just going on in the US, um, in fact, all over the world. Some of the early, the early adopters actually, Mexico uh, through their, through Canavio has been um, digitizing specimens for a long time, um, but also, um, and also, but very new actually, coming late to the game, the Europeans in the last, or five years have developed DISCO, which is uh, a, a, an attempt to kind of digitize and unite all European natural history collections. They have a much larger job. They have the most, they have the oldest, um, creates a lot of challenge. Um, Brazil has done a brilliant job through their species link program. I think it's one of the finest out there and has been organized in an absolutely brilliant, well-organized way. But I guess the gold standard of all is Australia and the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, oops, well, I guess I don't have a slide for that, but actually the Living Atlas of Living Australia, um, not only does it catalog all of the organisms, but it also uh, that occur in Australian museums, but it um, has tools for land managers, for educators, for school children, a bunch of tools built in that really go far beyond the user interfaces that most of us have. Unfortunately, most of the 
the user interfaces are geared toward somebody who's looking for a taxon who knows the taxonomic name, you know, or somebody who's looking for a organism from a geographical area, but it doesn't allow you to, to really think of other ways you might like to approach the data. But, but ALA is approaching that and they are the real innovators in this field. The largest repository is Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And they're also very innovative. I mean, they have, um, you know, a huge number, 2 billion occurrence records that also includes observations. It isn't only specimen or species occurrence records is documented by a specimen, um, but 89,000 uh, data sets and 22,000, um, more than 2,000 contributing institutions. Um, and uh, it, from this search box, you know, you can, you, you yeah, it's very simple. There's an advanced one too, but you can search all of those, all of those data. Um, they also have a, they also have a map showing the occurrence of all species occurrence data, and you can see where the United States is sort of brightly lit up, as is Europe. But obviously, there are still areas of the world where um, there either are no specimens or they just haven't been digitized yet. Um, Another thing that you can, and actually what's really cool is there's a sliding bar down here. You can you can do it, set it by century. So you could actually see how many were available along a time horizon, which is a fun, a fun thing to play with. One of the most, one of the biggest issues for us with digitizing data and making it available out there and free for download, which is what we want to do, is it's very hard for us, who I speak now as a collections manager, to know how our data is being used. People download it, they use it, maybe they tell us, or maybe they acknowledge us, or maybe they don't. Um, and, you, you know, all of this digitization and running museums requires money. And the main reason we can make an argument for funding is because of the critical nature of our data. But if you can't cite specific uses of your data, then it's hard. You can you can say all sorts of things you can imagine about how they can be used, but you know, real citations. So GBIF has, for the community, has attempted to um, help with this. So when you download a data set from GBIF, um, you have an identifier for that, and then they track that, and you're supposed to then, when you submit your data set, you're supposed to include that identifier. And then from there, they can keep a list of the, the types of studies that have used the data set. It doesn't mean that your individual records were used, but at least they were in the data set that was part of the analysis. And you, this, I just did a general search and it comes up with um, a, a paper about spruce, new way spruce susceptibility to um, beetle, bark beetles and, and uh, associated with temperature and canopy, uh, shifts in body population sizes, large scale studies, um, uh, talking about an, an organism that's a potential winter, winner under climate and change in South Africa, et cetera. Um, and you you can also search them by your own individual institution. You can find out who's stored your data. So they provide a great service, not only to anybody who wants to search the data, but also those who contribute to it. But we still have, we've made huge progress. Um, we still have a lot of challenges. We didn't come close to digitizing all of the natural history specimens in the US um, in that 10 year period. We got very close with fungi. We've gotten remarkably close with plants. Insects, not so much. And fossils, fossils really, I mean, it, it's, it's so difficult. Um, we, I, we, there's not even, I mean, not even any basis for making a statistic about it. There have been several large grants for fossils, but they, they have their own complications. So, so we have a lot more to do. And also critical, uh, as I mentioned, all these wonderful standards we have for getting the data in a standardized fashion, they haven't always been followed. Um, there's a lot of, um, to go fast and be able to do this, you really couldn't hire people who were going to lavish attention on each record. We need, we tended, we had to sort of NSF required that this process on average costs no more than about a dollar a specimen. I don't know if anybody was ever able to quite to achieve that, but that means you have to work fast and you just have to ignore a lot of things. So we ignored a lot of things and there are a lot, there are the, the data sometimes are not very clean. Um, and 
uh, when you download a data set to use, there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen before, in most cases, in my experience, um, before it's really usable. We uh, are working on the idea that let's, we haven't finished everything. Let's just at least make sure that we don't develop backlogs in the future, because of course we continue to collect um, herbarium specimens alone, which is my area. There's at least a million new herbarium specimens added to the, the world's collection on an annual basis. And we should be doing all of that digitally and not, not leaving a backlog that needs to be digitized. So the idea of born digital collections where all the data are, you know, are, don't have to be copied and recopied. Um, again, I sort of mentioned user interfaces. It's sort of linear now that you can search on a bunch of different things, but to get meaningful data back, there's really only a few key searches you can, you can do. Um, and that's an area that, that really needs a lot of exploration. Many of the people who are now, after collections are digitized or while they're being digitized, it's now just another new collection that a place has to manage, but requires different skills than, you know, pinning insects and uh, all of that kind of um, manual work with physical objects. There's data management, and that is not a typical skill uh, that, that in the past, at least, um, people who go into collections management have been trained in. And frankly, they're often not paid enough to really know about that. And you know, these are not high paying jobs. And uh, it's sort of usually the assumption that if you have some mad data skills, you probably aren't going to be working in a museum. But these data, are, you know, require management. They're going to require updating to new formats, all sorts of things. And uh, so a lot of people are just sitting with a bunch of, um, you know, files on hard drives, um, but really no idea about like how to maintain them into the future and how, and in universities, there's often a great collaboration with libraries who really do think about these things as well as um, people in data science. Uh, but but many times it, it's these, this, the future doesn't look bright for how these data are gonna be maintained. And then, as I mentioned also earlier, we really have to learn to be able to speak with one voice about both living and preserved collections and really appreciate and internalize where we, where we have similar efforts and where we don't. So that kind of brings me to the work of this biodiversity collections network that I think I'm part of on the steering committee. This started out as an NSF RCN grant in like 2015. Uh, which ended in, I guess, 2021, but we've continued it on because we think it's an important thing. It, we have representatives from a variety of different collection types as well as organizations. Um, AIBS is part of it, as well as um, the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections and um, the uh, several other you know, large organizations have representatives that sit on it. And our, our main goal is to really try to address some of these challenges as best we can, um, and to just in general promote the use of natural history collections, especially to try to promote it beyond our own community, which is my um, favorite. We have a steering committee of 15 people. We augmented it in 2021 so that we could add representatives from living collections, also federal collections. Federal collections are an entity un, 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 you know, sort of off on their own, managed by their own set of rules. But again, they need to be part of the community because we are all talking about the same sorts of, of data. We do a number of things, advocacy. We've um, talked with congressional um, folks, support staff, I guess, um, surveys, podcasts, you know, the usual sorts of things. And we've had developed a number of initiatives. One we're very proud of is that the Chips and Science Act actually has language in it about collections and management of specimens. Um, and that started with us. But what I'm gonna be focusing on more is this last one, which is the Extended Specimen Network. Um, and this drew, grew out at NSF's request about 2017 when this whole ABC program was winding down. They asked Beacon to uh, get a consensus from the community about where to go next. 
what's next? We know digitization. They weren't going to accept the answer. We just need more digitization. They wanted to know what's the next step with this. So we did a number of surveys and interviews and so forth. And then a group met. And we came up with the idea of the, the development of an extended specimen network. And there are a couple of publications that arose from that. What does that mean? Well, this diagram sort of shows that um, we think of physical specimens sitting in their cabinets down here. Um, the primary extension of those data was to transcribe the data, digitize them, as I talked about. Um, and then a secondary extension is all of the things that are derived from them, the DNA from specimens, isotopes, um, tissue samples uh, from living collections, um, things that are actually in, in images, gene sequences. These are all can be traced back to one individual that they came from. And then taking a tertiary ex extension, we're going now not so much to the um, to the realm of the individual unit on a, in a on a pin, for example, but things that are associated with that taxon, which where we get into traits, phylogenies, descriptions, interactions, biotic interactions, distributions, uh, conservation status uses. So these are basically those types of information come from an understanding of the amalgamation of data about specimens, which, is, which becomes the basis of species, which then um, be, become relevant at that, at that outer layer. So what we imagined was the creation of a network, a data network that would link all of these, you know, so that you could really enter at any point, and perhaps you're really not even interested in specimens. You might be entering from some other point, but but where there is a specimen, you could be attached to it. And if you're talking about specimens, um, you could find your way to all the way it's been used, and also to how it fits into the larger bio biotic you know, complex. Um, and the, the components of this were, again, some things I tried to roll in, some of the things we knew we needed, or in digital documentation, continued digitization editing, a lot of data integration and cyber structure, um, uh, shoring up institution and community infrastructure, and also education and workforce training. Those are all kind of components of this extended specimen network idea. Um, and the whole idea, you know, being that you could, I think Paula, Paula maybe, and I did a presentation on this. She was on the, the committee that came up with the extended specimen, and this is her slide, but imagining a research, how this could be used in a research context. You have two species, you're trying to understand what factors explain where one grows or one lives and a, or another lives, and then you could call upon all of these linked data, isotype, phylogenetic, um, uh, Venus phenotypic data as well as deep structural data, gene data, culture collection of associated microbes, for example. So that's what we envisioned. Um, and but there were two things. There, there was there were a lot of things that were needed to make this work. A whole lot of money for one thing. But putting that aside, um, obviously there are cyber structure and, and challenges about how to link all of these things that have never been linked before. But the really the biggest challenges are both um, building communities. So building a community um, uh, worldwide, because obviously organisms don't pay attention to national borders. So we had, this was never going to go anywhere if we didn't have buy-in from an international community. And also developing relationships with other data communities that, that, that don't interact with us at all now. Um, the first one was was easy because at the same time that we were doing this extended specimen thinking, um, there were the, this disco group in Europe was also thinking along the same lines. And um, we kind of now since 2020, we've been meeting and kind of sorting out our, our adjusting our, our our ideas to be a common one. And we've ended up with something that we call a, a group called the International Partners on the Digital Extended Specimen. And we also um, uh, have now kind of broadened the term to be digital, ex digital extended specimen, which is kind of a combination of both. And this working group started out just Europe and the US, but now it includes representatives from essentially all the countries that have large data stores, Australia, South America, uh, Brazil, um, South Africa, 
China, and so forth. Um, so that group is moving forward and is all in agreement. So we didn't have to do a whole lot of effort for that. But reaching out to da different data communities has always been, you know, everybody's in silos in science, we know this, and breaking through those is, is, is a challenge. But we recently were funded by NSF for a series of workshops that we're calling Building an Integrated, Open, Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reusable <laughs> Data Network, or BioFair for short. And the goal is to try to engage an expansive set of um, prospective partners towards building a network, which might look like the extended specimen network, or might look like something else, but anyway, that would link these. And we have two years in order to have a number of conversations with different groups about this. Um, we're also taking some team science and inclusive science workshops training, but the main activities we'll be doing with other people are listening sessions with different communities and then a summative workshop. Um, so the left is some of the groups that we have uh, kind of made, made sort of large groupings of people that we want to engage, federal agencies, ecologists, environmental data. Um, genetic and genomic data, informaticians, and people in public health. There's a very strong connection, of course, with species occurrence in public health. Think of COVID, for example. Um, and so that's not the comprehensive list. That's kind of the grant proposal because we did reach out to individuals in all of these areas and found some common interest. But we're still eager. If you know of other communities, um, we'd love to hear about that. But we imagine in our listening sessions that we will, it'll be sort of a get to know you thing where we will try to you know, understand the current status of data in different areas, plans for future development, greatest challenges, kind of like what I've told you today about biodiversity um, data, um, about possibilities for integration. Is it interesting? How, how might you do it? And um, what, you know, do you think it's important? And if so, what do you think would have to be done? So we're gonna hold these with a bunch of um, these different groups of people, including ESOL is um, Ty. Yeah, Ty, yeah, yeah, you, you, we tagged you. Yeah. I'll chew your ear off, don't worry. But <laughs> the last thing we want is silence. And yeah. come back to that at the end, I'll tell you why. But anyway, these are some of the groups with whom, with whom we have, you know, a, a, we have agreement for participation in this, and it's a pretty wide range of folks. We're very pleased about that. Um, and then in the final workshop, we'll have some people from each listening session um, come together uh, in a several day workshop um, to try to sum up. You know, do we have something here? Um, what are principles should guide any forward effort? Uh, use cases, what would be some very compelling use cases for these, for such an amalgamation of data and um, priorities, challenges, et cetera, et cetera. And that should be a report, which then we hope, you know, will get a lot of traction. Um, we are not, there's the, those 10, the slide showed you the slide with the 15 people, they're all involved somehow. We're also very keen to engage um, emerging professionals. So we have members of the team, equal partners in all of this will be three um, emerging professional students, um, a PhD or master's current students, and then three early career professionals. Um, so if anybody's interested, we still have a few days to accept applications. I think we, got a lot, but we could still use more. So um, some of the things we hope would be an output is a final report um, that describes everything we did, statement of engagement, which might articulate some principles for working forward if people are interested in working forward, a roadmap, if we get that far, and uh, you know, one or more publications that summarizes all of the above. And then in terms of getting the word out, we also have some organizations that have agreed to help with this. Um, those are listed here. The one that doesn't have a title is Black and Genetics. Um, that's the first circle. Um, but all of these will help spread the word. One, we're done. So <laughs> I mentioned silence is what we want least. Um, so last week, the um, we have an annual meeting of uh, online meeting of people who are or were involved in the digitization collection. They call it BioDigicon. 
And we had, took the opportunity of this BioDigicon to present sort of an abbreviated version of what I told you to our own community. Because we thought, you know, we need to keep them in the loop. It's this project really isn't about them. It's on their behalf, but they need to be engaged and involved. And we, you know, we, we thought, well, let's find out. Like, what what have your experiences been? What other data communities have you been engaged in? How what have what have been your experiences? You know, um, <laughs> there was dead silence. <laughs> there were forty or fifty people in the participants, and nobody said anything. Now, I, you know. Um, and I, we sort of talked about this in advance, that could very well happen. And finally, after we prodded and prodded, we got one person to speak up and who said, why would I care about that if I can't even do, make some linkage between one thing or another? I don't, I don't have time for this. I have more important problems. And, and I thought, oh, this is so typical. And I don't mean to rag on the biological collections community. There's many reasons why we are the way we are. It's usually about having little respect and little funding. But um, everybody thinks in terms of a zero sum game, you know, that I'm only going to give or get a little bit, you know, and so I better put that little bit towards my biggest problem rather than thinking, what if, what if we could have what we really wanted, you know, what if we could put something that was really great and it wasn't worried about it. So, <laughs> you know, as, as expected, uh, you know, why would I wouldn't even, we can't even do this or that. Why should we? So I thought, and we will, when we have our next BCon meeting, we'll spend some time talking about the need to outreach in our own community as well. You know, <laughs> so it's one thing to think of engaging other communities, but you know, there, you can't, you have to be careful about getting out too far in advance of your own people. And so one thing we have to think about is how do we, as we unfold this, how do we convince people that this is something they should be interested in for the long term? You may not solve the problem that's on your desk today, but yeah, it's a long future. So, so that's my story. I appreciate the opportunity to um, to talk to you today, and I'd be really curious about the details. So it sounds like when, when you're making these networks, they have to be physical specimens or no, I mean, no? The, with the, I mean, the, the, the data network would obviously be the, the, the digital specimen, which would right. be the image plus the record, which would link back someone. It should always be that from that you can go back to the physical thing, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not part of the, it's not obviously not part of the electronic network. Well, my question from that is, have, have you thought about incorporating other networks, for example, um, nature's notebook, so phenology data that's collected yeah, great. Yeah. by, you know, citizens or the, I, yes. I've worked with the PhenoCam network, you know, so images of mm -hmm. phenology of trees. Right, right, um, right. Have you worked well, we, with that, that That's a That's a completely appropriate um, level to, a part to come in is probably on the, what, second or third level, but yeah, for sure. I mean, absolutely. Okay. There's cool. a ton of observation data. Yeah. And there have been, there's a number of attempts to kind of link observations to specimens. The trick comes in that linking an observation to a specimen is, is um, you're not actually seeing that very one. So it's a linkage via right. taxon. So a little bit tricky um, and people do worry about, you know, citizen science data and being incorrectly identified. But, you know, uh, INAT has research grade collections and for the most part, those are those are quite good. But yeah, combining um, observational data is a really key part of this um, oh. because that is exactly what people are seeing now. And it helps us kind of get at the whole idea of data absence. It's just not very easy to do with specimens. You have them or you don't, but why don't you have them? You know, so you 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 can't really do much about something being being gone. You only know where it is. You don't know where it used to be or it should be, but isn't. So definitely involving um, yeah, observational observation data. Cool. That sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'd like to understand now you are working on this biofair uh, project. And I'd like to hear from you what you have been developing in terms of policies uh, related to data ethics, data sovereignty. So because definitely 
you are facing issues. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad to hear from you. Sure. Um, and that goes that that goes back to sort of digitizing and sharing, and this is a, an issue that's been grappled with, of course, um, a lot. Um, there are a number of embargoes on data, either because they are culturally sensitive or because they represent um, populations of very rare species. And if somebody knows where it was collected, they could go and collect it again, especially a problem for things like cacti. I mean, sitting aside animals, which, you know, move around, but, but you could pretty easily go to a place where rare cactus grew and dig it up. There's not much else in the landscape. So we have been dealing with all of those issues. And it's actually a huge, huge raging debate about the level of embargo um, we would only ever use publicly available data. So the data provider has to have agreed to make it share it. They, they're the ones who ultimately control what gets shared and what doesn't. We assume anything that appears in B and GBIP that, that people have decided that that's okay to share and that the benefits of sharing it far for scientific purposes far outweigh the, um, you know, the various problems that sovereignty of various sorts come along. So that's a decision that um, that institutions make before they share it. It comes to the level of screening these data. Again, it's wildly uh, controversial. Um, there are people who believe no data should be embargoed for any reason, and you just let the chips fall where they may. And there are other people who say that that's irresponsible. And I always know as a curator, I mean, I could understand with the open data thing, but I certainly didn't want an article in the New York Times that about the destruction of an existing species because someone got the data from my institution. Yeah. So there are a number of considerations. But always that that plays a huge part in everything. But but for the most part, when we're talking about building a data network, we're sort of assuming that these are data people have agreed to make make free and openly available. Yeah, my, my, my main question here, uh, and this is something that like for example, I work with uh species distribution mm -hmm. model for sure. example so how this uh difference between like how open i want to yeah make my data like because for example i'm from brazil yeah. for example uh i know that in us we we see open science open data in a way that's different than in brazil yeah. we see that yeah. so we have this country uh level divergence so to say and um so a global level divergence mm -hmm. uh so how does that affect like the availability of data you know it, it, and, could, it could be however um in brazil species link is freely open and available yeah. to everyone yeah um now you mentioned like doing species distributions, which obviously means you've taken the data, you've done some manipulations to it. It's it's now sort of your intellectual property. That's a totally different thing. You know, you might or might not be willing to share that. Maybe you wouldn't want to share it until your larger work was published. You know, so so there's that issue as well. You know, um, when we're talking about just the specimens and the data that comes with them that anyone can see. There, the limitations are smaller than if you start talking about incorporating information that somebody has um, worked hard to, to gather and their intellectual property went into it. And um, they might have problems about sharing. And that's where you get into another thing is about attribution. You know, how is there a way that you could combine synthesized research about a species as well as these more or less freely open and available uh, primary data? in such a way that attribution could be maintained. And of course, as I mentioned, collections also like the attribution too, but that's that's a serious consideration that has to be dealt with. I really don't want to dominate, but I have a, a, a last question. <laughs> so yeah, because, uh, so thinking on this spatial distribution, uh, is there a way, it's just like something that came in my mind thinking on this, Data availability issues and how this affect like modeling yeah. species distribution. Yeah, and uh, if there is a way that we, you, for example, thinking on within the uh, databases, like have a uncertainty layer, something yeah. that that calls like we know that in this place we have two thousand 
like 12,000 vascular plants, mm -hmm. but we only have available from this area. Right. Second Amon. And in the other areas, for the US, you can have a, a larger. Right. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. Yeah. So, yeah, I yeah. don't know if so so it's possible you, that could help. And here I wander a little bit out of my air expertise, but you are obviously extrapolating. You can do a distribution. You can take area of occurrence or extent of occupancy, right? well, however that goes. And you can you can describe a polygon that should include where a species occurs, you know, and, and you may have a lot of data in there, you know. Yeah. Um, I know my colleagues in New York who worked in tropical rainforests and mm -hmm. another forest in Brazil were always very leery of these um, kind of extensions because they they just they they said it led to conclusions about ecology ecology of species that just did not match up with what they saw on the ground. But I think if you could combine that with people who actually have personal knowledge of where organisms grow, plus satellite imaging. There's an amazing work done on, on identification of at the species level of forest trees, you know, from satellite. And all of those things combined could maybe fill in those those gaps. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Lerna. Sounds good anyway. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'd sort of following up on the sovereignty question, but at ESA this year, I was at a session and somebody stood up, a tribal member stood up and said, anybody here from a museum we want our seeds back. Uh -huh. And so I understand that data sovereignty and who owns the original specimen is a question. Re repatriation is a question. My question is about sort of the provenance conversation that happens in the metadata. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's room for these debates about ownership to go yeah. directly in the provenance? Oh, sure. And be yeah. sort of recorded? Yes, absolutely. The anthropologists have done a lot more work on this than, than we have in natural history. Well, I guess... Anthropological collections are natural history collections, but they're their own special type. So this whole NAGPRA Act, but which is a U.S. government act about repatriation of data, that's been in place for more than a decade now, maybe quite a bit more than a decade. And they've talked a lot about provenance and, and re repatriation and of data as well as, as items, although the items are generally the thing you hear about, you know funerary items and so forth like that, um, that are of cultural significance. But there's definitely room for, for that um, to be talked about. Um, we haven't had many discussions and um, they aren't listed on that group of people we wanna engage. But because I came to ESOL, one of the of one of the uh, one day of the of the summit, I you know I've made notes about names of people of native data networks and so forth. So we definitely want plan to engage them and see you know see what um, what the issues are and how 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 we can address it. You know, obviously, whether or not a, an institution gives back something is not sort of out of the purview of what we're talking about. But um, data provenance is important, and um, there actually there actually are some tribal collections in the herbarium world that I'm familiar with. There are three um, that I think of um, two two herbaria in the Navajo Nation, one in the Nez Perce Nation, and I think there are at least two or three others in South Dakota. So getting some of, and maybe there are animal collections on those reservations too. I just don't know about them, um, but it'd be very interesting to have a conversation with them, find out what what would they want. What are people willing to do? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sort of. My second question is about biobanking and yeah. the extinction. So yeah, it's like how how do you feel generally about different uses of these preserved specimens? You need to recreate a. Well, like one example is people are trying to yak yeah, clone a black-footed ferret that's yeah. hundred years old so that they yeah. can breed it and get some new genetic material in the new ones, and so it's like. I mean, know. I'm not an expert on that. I. It, and I, some of the stories I've heard about that, especially ones funded by celebrities and things, just sounds very sort of gimmicky and pseudosciencey to me. And I fear that in the end, it will kind of do our community more harm than good. But you know, maybe there's a reason why it's important. I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally wouldn't close the door on it. But I just, I, I have been a little suspicious of most of the, now the black ferret a hundred years ago. That that doesn't sound so unreasonable. But when people are talking about woolly mammoths and so forth. I'm not sure they, but I, I grew up with Jurassic Park, I'm gonna say. I can't imagine this is gonna go wrong somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sure.
Some people said they're interested in collaborating with you and sent really? emails along. So we'll oh, you'll them. send us along to me? Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad. Fantastic. And we come from a tribal college, from Oglala Lakola College in South um, Dakota. Oh, that's oh, nice. Alexander. So that's someone online. Oh, yeah. hi. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know where that, I was <laughs> a little confused. Can they hear? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you have a question or? No, I, I just appreciate your presentation. I really appreciate because I have a natural history museum background and we try to actually organize and then um, some of our collections, which is just in the beginning. So this seminar, I want to also thank you, Casey, for doing that. It was just perfect timing for us. So I appreciate your talk, Barb. So glad. Can we can we get your contact information somehow? We'd love to keep you in yeah, the loop. Send it yeah. over. Right. You can, um, I share our contact on the chat, but okay. um, after that, if Casey can share also your contact, I will certainly be sending oh, you shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. I was going to ask, are people like trying to get access to your visual photograph collections to build training data? Sets yes, for machine for AI, absolutely. Oh yeah, that's, that's pretty actively going on. Yep. Um, the, in my institution, before I retired, we uh, were involved. We had some some friends at Google who worked with us. Um, with their, they have an image analysis challenge every year. I forget what it's called. But anyway, we submitted a couple of years to that. And the people who competed for that came up with algorithms that could take a known set of plant specimens um, that were, you know, kind of the, 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 the training set. And then they could take those images and then apply them to a, an unknown set. And even without, you know, really, for example, we didn't feed it with information about where species might or might not occur. You know, just basically that we had a success rate of between, of, of between 80 and 85 percent. And so if you could combine it with, you know, known distribution, so you didn't have an Ecuadorian species being identified as one from Sri Lanka, you know, um, then you could really, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of power in here uh, for matching knowns and unknowns. Um, so yes, absolutely. That's one of the huge things that's come out of having this huge number of images available. Yeah. All right. Thanks very Thank much. You.